All right, we're looking at the fund alpha case study here on asset allocation. Let's scroll down and read the first question. Looks like we got a lot of tables here. Describe how a sovereign wealth fund alpha could use the theoretical global mass multi-asset portfolio as a reference point for its asset allocation. Identify two significant differences between the fund's current allocation and this theoretical portfolio and explain the potential implications of these differences. Sovereign Wealth Fund Alpha, managing $100 billion, is reassessing its investment strategy. The fund's current asset allocation is as follows. So we've got current asset allocation. Uh, we got global equities, half the portfolio, government bonds, 30%, corporate bonds, 10%, commodities, 5%, and cash, 5%. The fund is considering the following theoretical global multi-asset portfolio as a reference. Um, so table 2, theoretical portfolio, we've got... Global equities, 35%. Global bonds, 45 And then main differences here, we've got some real estate, private equity, and also some commodities and cash. Um, so we let's look back at this. So we want to talk about how we could kind of use the this um, theoretical portfolio to kind of look at as a reference point for the current asset allocation and then talk about two differences two big differences between these two allocations so let's start pulling in our answer here so typically if something if we're going to use something as a reference a good way to kind of look at that is looking at it as a benchmark and then this is going to show us the differences in how um, the current allocation versus the current versus um, the global portfolio with more significant alternatives exposure, kind of see how those behave differently over time. Um, so that'll be uh, first check mark there. And then for the other two points, two significant differences and explain. So there's a, you could go a fair number of ways with this. I went with two different answers here on um, the two answers I went with were on global equities and then alt exposure. So 15% more global equities relative to the theoretical portfolio could lead to more volatility over time by being allocated to this riskier asset class. That's another point. And then alternatives exposure, only 3% in the fund relative to the theoretical portfolio, which I think was um, 10, 5, 3, so 18. Um, this makes the portfolio significantly less liquid by allocating to real estate and private equity should balance the risk reward versus liquidity needs of the fund. Um, so that's uh, kind of the identification and then explaining uh, potential implications. Um, you could have also looked at the difference in the bond exposure, which was about a 5% difference, um, or talked more specifically about real estate and private equity. There's a few different ways you could have gone with this, um, but those are Two answers you could have given right there. Question two, explain how the risk parity approach differs from the fund's current asset allocation method. Discuss two potential advantages of adopting a risk parity approach for sovereign wealth fund alpha. Um, note each advantage should be discussed in a separate paragraph. So we left off here. Let's read a little bit more. The investment team is exploring a risk parity approach and has calculated the following risk contributions. Table three, risk contributions of current portfolio. So we've got um, our four risk factors here, equity risk, duration risk, credit risk, and commodity risk, and we can see those contributions. So we've got 80, 15, three, and two. Um, so risk parity, let's pull this in. Risk parity focuses on spreading our risk contribution more equally across risk factors. So rather than the contribution being 80% equity risk, these would probably be 25, 25, 25, 25 or adjusted to whatever we want, but I think equ equally is typically how risk parity works. So we're gonna spread our risks um, to 25, 25, 25, and then um, that's gonna determine how many assets we have in equities, how much we have in bonds, or duration versus credit risk, and how much we have in commodities. So that's gonna basically lead these asset class weightings to be significantly different. Um, so discussing how risk parity differs, uh, risk parity focuses on spreading risk contribution equally across risk factors and then utilizes leverage to increase or decrease the risk return to the desired level. Um, and whereas our current method doesn't utilize leverage and has contribution and has risk contribution concentrated in equities, 80% in equities. 
Um, so those are the how the risk parity differs, and then two potential advantages of risk parity. Um, one, equal spread of risk factors, um, contribution to risk versus concentration of risk in equities, so better diversification. Rather than having 80% concentration, we would have 25 here. Um, and then potentially higher risk adjusted returns, higher allocation to diversifying assets, which can help in drawdowns, while use of leverage can increase returns. So um, that's our answer there. And just to kind of talk a little bit more about the risk parity. So event is essentially what you're doing in risk parity is you end up allocating way more to kind of government bonds, commodities, and less to global equities. So you're in these less risky asset classes, but then the major risk comes into play when you start employing that leverage. So while you're taking less equity risk, you're then also going to be taking on more leverage risk, which isn't really kind of considered as a risk factor. Uh, so just something to keep in mind there. Question three. Based on the provided information ratio and excess return data, recommend whether Sovereign Wealth Fund Alpha should use active or passive management for each of its major asset classes, global equities, government bonds, corporate bonds, and commodities, and justify your recommendations. So the fund is evaluating different implementation strategies, current performance data for active managers. So we've got our active management data, we've got our information ratios and excess returns, um, and then we'll kind of use that to base our answers off. So typically, uh, for active management, we're going to want these numbers to be higher. So higher numbers for information ratio and higher numbers for excess returns are going to kind of lead to justifying, um, are going to kind of lead to what we recommend. And then justification for those recommendations, um, that's where kind of looking one level deeper at the specific market and kind of the different nuances of those markets will kind of come into play on whether we want to go the active or passive route. So we're going to kind of balance the numbers with some of that qualitative information of the market. So I've got all the paragraphs written out here. So global equities starting here, higher information ratio and excess returns suggest active management is the better option. So we've got the 0.3 IR with um, 1.2% ex excess returns. And then um, for kind of the justification, looking a little more qualitatively, uh, global equity markets are large and nuanced, which may lead to inefficiencies and opportunities for skilled managers to outperform. So essentially, there's going to be wide dispersion in different types of companies and stocks, um, which will lead to the opportunity for active managers to kind of avoid the bad companies, pick the good companies, and do um, outperform over time. Government bonds, uh, low information ratio. Point one and also low excess returns suggest passive due to limited value uh, added through active and then um, justifying that a little bit further. Government bond markets are generally efficient um, and not too complex, less opportunity for outperformance. Um, it's kind of a government bond is a government bond. If you're going to be outperforming here, you're probably going to have to do it more so on um, kind of taking duration risk or um, some other something else like that. Uh, next, corporate bonds. Uh, comparing this to equities, too, we have even an even higher information ratio and excess return. And it's going to be a similar answer to equities as well. We're going to have higher IR and excess returns, suggest active management. Corporates have opportunity for superior credit analysis slash security selection to drive alpha. So kind of similar to global equities. There's a It's a large market and there's a lot of different credits and companies and issues, issuers out there. So if a manager can identify the better companies, avoid the bad companies, they can kind of do well over time, which is simply put, but not easy to do. Uh, commodities, lastly. Information, excess returns, moderate. Um, however, we would probably suggest passive due to the volatility of commodity markets. And they also have many unpredictable factors that drive prices. So it's likely going to be different, difficult for an active manager to persistently outperform. And so a more recent example is a lot of these are, a lot of the commodities can be weather related, which some of that can be very unpredictable. So in, I don't remember the exact country, but in Africa, they had a drought um, last year or recently and that spiked cocoa prices um, because they weren't able to harvest as much cocoa um, for the year. Um, so it, the, the idea that a 
active manager could kind of predict that and then profit off of that is a little um, far-fetched. So that's kind of just one real life example of um, how commodity markets um, being active in commodity markets may not work. All right, last question on this case. Evaluate Sovereign Wealth Fund Alpha's current calendar-based rebalancing strategy. The fund's current rebalancing strategy is calendar-based, occurring quarterly. So this question is pretty open-ended, so I just kind of wrote down a few points, um, kind of talking about what it is, and then some downsides and some positives up here. So calendar-based strategies are simple and may keep investors from making drastic changes in their portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are, I guess, some of the positives. And then downsides of calendar-based um, asset allocation can drift, drift significantly during the period, leading to misalignment of asset allocation to risk profile. And then um, trading may be unnecessary every quarter if asset prices have not changed much and could lead to unnecessary taxes, depending on tightness of tolerance bands. So if... If we have too strict of tolerance bands, um, trading every single quarter may just is going to lead to unnecessary trading, um, which is something we're kind of trying to avoid by being systematic with this. So a couple upsides, a couple downsides, and I think that should do it for this question.